Hello and welcome to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast, your serving of wine trends and passionate people beyond the bottle. I'm Lauren Buzio, the managing editor here at Wine Enthusiast, and in this episode, contributing editor Christina Picard explores the current state of Australian red wines with Aussie wine writer, speaker, and journalist Mike Benny. Think all Aussie reds are big, bold fruit bombs that you could cut with a knife? Well, it might just be time to think again. Sure, sun-soaked Australia may not be the first place that comes to mind when looking for lighter-bodied reds, but in a land as vast and diverse as Oz, cool climate regions abound, as do acidity-loving producers of all shapes and sizes looking to lighten things up. We'll give you the tips on where to look, producers to keep an eye on, and what bottles to pop to experience the fresher side of the Down Under. But first, a word from today's sponsor for another refreshing treat, Barefoot Hard Seltzer. A hard seltzer that's made with real wine? That's right, Barefoot Hard Seltzer is here, brought to you by the nation's most awarded wine brand. Barefoot Hard Seltzer packs delicious flavor into every can with three simple ingredients, sparkling water, natural fruit flavors, and real wine. Plus, Barefoot Hard Seltzer is only 70 calories, two grams of sugar, and gluten-free. Find Barefoot Hard Seltzer in the Hard Seltzer aisle in a 12-can variety pack or a four-pack. Barefoot Hard Seltzer, wine glass optional. Mike, thanks for taking the time to chat with me from Lockdown, Sydney. Thank you very much for having me. Honestly, I think the only way I was ever going to be able to pin you down for this, being the busy, highly in-demand wine guy that you are, was to catch you in the middle of a global pandemic when you're being (laughs) forced to stay at home. I'm kidding. Seriously, I'm very grateful for your time and um, feel really lucky to be able to chat with you about about this specific subject. That said, you are a prolific writer, editor, presenter, wine judge, et cetera, et cetera, down under. And so I really could have asked you virtually about anything Aussie wine related. And I know that you would have an ocean of interesting info and stories to tell. But because we are limited on time, I have to pin you down to talk about one still very broad topic within Aussie wine. And that is about light reds, light red wines, which, although it might be hard for many Aussies to believe, feels like a contradiction in terms somewhat to many Americans who I think still associate Australia with being a producer solely of big rich Shiraz. And if you're a lover of that style, there is another podcast episode that I hosted with another Aussie called Tim Harris, where we do talk about all things Aussie Shiraz. But today, uh, it's the complete opposite of that style. And Mike, you're the perfect guy to walk us through it. So let's talk light red wines in Australia. Well, look, I, I like, first of all, to frame such discussions by describing what I call the cultural vernacular of Australia. So if you think about Australia as this very big island right in the southern bit of the globe and you think about its warm, sunny days, the Indian summers indeed that last sometimes seemingly like nine months of the year, and you think about the fact that most of the cities, the big cities of Australia, are coastal, uh, that we live within proximity of the ocean, that we have a wealth of seafood that for a lot of the year, our dining experience is a plain air, that they're outdoorsy, that we're picnicking, that we're by the beach uh, eating and drinking, and that we have most of our food cues coming from Mediterranean cuisine, the great Italian migrants of the 1950s into Australia, and by and large uh, of more recent times, the great influx of Southeast Asian immigrants who have very much so influenced our pantries, giving us ginger, garlic, and chili as staples that we use in most of our cooking. The interesting thing about Australia and its image of wine is that we've got it kind of the wrong way around, that those big reds aren't really synonymous with outdoors, seafood, spicy Asian food, the Mediterranean cuisine that's light and grilled or salady. And indeed, it is the light, fresh red wine styles, the stuff that you can put in the fridge, drink with a little chill in it, take into the parks with tumblers and crafts. That's the stuff that really speaks more fluently about how we eat, live, breathe and sleep in Australia. And so therefore it's increasingly an important part of the conversation around what Australian wine looks like. That being said, Australia's wine history, which stretches back to 1788 when the first colonists came 
and planted flags and erected tents in Sydney Harbour, came with grapevines with the ambition of creating a colony that would have some of the airs and sophistications of back home in England, where wine was part of culture, uh, particularly of the more highfalutin blue blood set. Uh, So Australia's history with wine stretches right back to its first uh, colonies. And the idea was to frame most of Australia's wine in the same way that Europe had been producing wine. And indeed, if you look to the very first wine region in Australia, the Hunter Valley, which is a warm climate wine region, but the wines that inherently come out of that place produced from Shiraz, uh, from vineyards that are over 150 years old at times, are 12.5% alcohol to 13% alcohol typically uh, and can last very long periods of time in cellar and drink young and fresh when they are presented in their youth that we really have got the image of Australia about face in terms of historical context and then cultural context. It's an interesting thing to discuss, and I'm very grateful that you have me here to do so. I thought that was that was the perfect way to to sort of open with kind of flipping flipping the image of what I think uh, a lot of us here in the states have of Australia. I mean, certainly we like you say you have this lifestyle of um, of beaches and outdoor you know outdoor living, and then on the flip side of that, these wines that are you know pretty high in alcohol and pretty rich and pretty big, and certainly there is a place for those, and they also come with their own you know their own history and tradition and. For, some warmer regions like Barossa and McLaren Vale, but also, you know, stretching back even further than that, you have these Shiraz that are still, you know, at the 12.5, 13% alcohol and much more sort of in a, in a mid, you know, mid body range, um, and not maybe quite as big as, um, as the picture here might be of those. So can you kind of lay the map out, uh, for people in terms of, um, Australian wine regions, I, you don't need to name all 64, <laughs> but um, if you could just talk about particularly those that would specialize in and focus on lighter bodied styles, both great varieties and styles, um, sort of specialize in those and the reasons for that, where they might be on the map. Definitely. Look, I, I think that's a, a two-part question, but I'll approach it in different ways because there's uh, an increasing interest in lighter bodied red wines being produced from warmer climate regions. In a sort of inverse proportion theory, a lot of the warmer climate regions uh, have given birth to a younger generation or avant-garde sect of winemakers who are approaching the personality of wines from those warm climate regions differently. Picking earlier, more judicious whole cluster usage, generally just looking to produce lighter, fresher wine styles. That's an important part of a conversation. But I think for the uh, larger answer to that question, Australia's 60-plus wine regions are almost universally thought of as warm climate because that is the image that Australia has portrayed through its full-flavoured, full-throttle, higher-alcohol, higher-concentrated red wines. That is is an issue for me because a lot of Australian wine regions are defined strictly as cool climate. And indeed, we would find snow in winter in many of these wine regions. Uh, Australia Which is- Which I a, think that, that comment right there would blow a lot of people's minds. <laughs> that's right. The concept of snow in any Australian, in any place in Australia. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's meagre snow. We, it really- resembles more, uh, you know, a slushy at a gas station more than, say, (laughs) feet of powder in Vail. But we do have an alpine area that actually forms a sort of important nexus point for a couple of different wine regions, uh, both in New South Wales, which is the, the, I guess you'd say, the premier state. It's the first large state of Australia. It's where Sydney is. And in the south of this state, which is on the eastern seaboard of Australia, uh, there is the alpine region uh, that spans into a a very small wine region called Tumbarumba. Tumbarumba is a subalpine district that was, I guess, planted initially with the idea of producing high-quality sparkling wine. Now, if you go on to the other side of the alpine area, you're in Victoria, which is another state of Australia that's the southeast part of Australia and in the northern part of Victoria 
There is a wine region called Alpine Valleys, appropriately so, that produces extraordinarily cool climate wine styles, has a wealth of plantings to Italian grape varieties. The segue from that is into the adjacent wine region of King Valley. Uh, King Valley was planted effectively in the 1950s and 1960s by Italian migrants to mixed agriculture, then to tobacco, and then when tobacco excises crushed that industry, the Italian families turned their plantings to grapes. Uh, And this is the beating heart of Prosecco production in Australia, let alone where, again, a lot of the emerging and interesting Italian-Australian wines come from, mostly with a lighter, brighter sense of red wine personality. Uh, and, 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 And further towards the west of the northern part of Victoria, let's call it central northern Victoria, there's the very premium, high quality and somewhat boutique wine region of Beechworth. Uh, and Beechworth is, of course, famed for producers like Giaconda, which would be a, let's call it Grand Marc Estate in Australia. Uh, extraordinary and exquisite Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Syrah. Uh, and, and, and there are a, a sort of little sect of small producers up there that adorn the wine lists of all the three castagna yeah all the top exactly castagna sorenberg uh, vigneron Smolzer, and brown these are names that are not necessarily uh, readily found outside of the great restaurants and wine bars of australia but are important in terms of the greater picture of australian wine so this alpine area is probably one of the most important things to talk about in terms of cool climate winemaking uh, but of course If you're even in New South Wales and you visit Sydney, it's often a first port of call for many travellers to Australia. The metropolis of Sydney, located almost equidistant between the northern part and southern part of the state of New South Wales, right smack bang on the harbour that then uh, extends out into many of the more bucolic beach scenes of Australia. If you drive approximately three hours west of Sydney, you reach the wine region of Orange. And Orange uh, actually enjoys quite um, quite a high elevation, uh, some, let's call it 3,000 feet above sea level. Uh, this is a place that decidedly finds snow in its wintertime. Uh, plantings at that sort of height include Pinot Noir, Syrah, at a, to an extent some Cabernet, um, Chardonnay and Riesling. And the wines here are, you know, very light, ethereal, uh, and often driven by acidity rather than deeper fruit character. And so New South Wales, which is often sort of seen as a a, a warmer climate state, indeed has hot spots, for want of a better expression, that are extremely cold in terms of wine growing. Uh, Of course, most people, when they're talking about Uh, Australian cool climate draw themselves directly into Victoria and use the reference points of places like the Yarra Valley. Um, And I know you visited the Yarra Valley on several occasions. Um, This is a place where red wines from the region are notoriously and traditionally low alcohol. Um, You'll find Cabernet, probably one of the most significant red grape varieties of the region in its early days. Uh, And the region has a very long historical context in terms of Victorian wine growing, uh, but it was revitalised by boutique estates in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And this is a a region that's not necessarily high in altitude, but sort of has a very undulating landscape of hills and valleys, uh, quite verdant and green, and a picturesque scene of, let's say, Australian bush between farms that intersperse this landscape and in amongst all of this the the main primary agriculture seems to be grape growing Um, and it's a place where some of the more exceptional producers that do make landfall in the United States people like the the the, the wonderful Mac Forbes the uh, exuberant personality that he is and his great focus on Pinot Noir specifically though he does make great Cabernet and Syrah in his downtime um, then he's joined by some of the, let's say, more more recent high-quality wine producers for the Yarra Valley, Giant Steps, uh, Jam Sheed, uh, Luke Lambert, all who are producing on smaller volume scales but all who have got a very good handle on cool climate winemaking. 
And of course, some of Australia's greatest estates, those who have produced very long lived, very sellable red wine styles that are lighter and fresher by their inherent personality, uh, are Yarra Yearing, uh, Yearingburg, uh, Yearing Station. There's a lot of Yearings in here, of course. <laughs> It took me ages to wrap my head around that, <laughs> to keep them all straight. <laughs> yeah, it's a landmark. Um, and, of course, Mount Mary. And Mount Mary would yeah. be, if you asked me to name my top 10 wine producers of Australia, uh, Mount Mary would find its way firmly into that mm. list uh, without fail. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of these wines have been the inspiration for the younger generation producers who could see that long-lived and bright and fresh lower alcohol wine styles were de rigueur if you're producing wine in this region. Um, these are wines of, from Yarra Valley, particularly of tension and you know shape of tannin and form of acidity, which doesn't necessarily tell the story of light, bright and fresh, let's say gluggable, thirst-quenching reds. Um, that for me seems to be more a story of places like the Adelaide Hills, which is mm -hmm. the wine-growing region just outside the city of Adelaide in South Australia. South Australia is, of course, the um, beating heart of Australia's wine industry. It's located at the southern part of Australia. Basically, if Australia looks like a big cookie floating in the ocean of the south of the globe, Somebody's taken a big bite out of the bottom part of Australia of that cookie. They do quite literally call it the Australian bite. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is called the Great Australian Bite. <laughs> um, and this this is where the uh, this is the southern part of the state of South Australia, and it's interesting because the southern part of South Australia basically sticks out into the Southern Ocean that rolls straight down into the Antarctic. Uh, so you can get quite a lot of cool climate influence coming off the ocean. Uh, and, of course, in and around the central parts of the south of South Australia, there's a lot of native bush, there's a lot of greenery, there's a lot of, uh, again, rolling hills and dales and little villages. But as you stretch up into the northern part of the state, it gets warmer and warmer and indeed becomes progressively desert-like and then ultimately is a desert in the centre of Australia. So it's, a, it's quite a, an extraordinarily and diverse landscape in South Australia. But for me, the... Main story here is, of course, about reversing the image of Australia's big, bold, muscular red wine styles that have emerged from places like the Barossa Valley, so renowned for you know, well-balanced at best times, but sometimes too overt perhaps for a lot of drinkers. The concentrated, dense red wines that have come from here are heartland stuff, delicious when done well, but sometimes perhaps a little bit too monochromatic in their image and sometimes in their drinking. Uh, and, of course, McLaren Vale, which straddles the sea, uh, it's a, a beautiful wine region that sort of cascades down off, again, bushland into varying soil profiles that run all the way down to the more sandy soils of vineyards that are adjacent to the ocean. And here, again, full-flavoured, full-throttle red wines have been the calling card but between those two regions is, of course, the Adelaide Hills, this wine region that's some 25 minutes in an UberX from downtown Adelaide City. And you'll find yourself in uh, these thatches of vineyard, bush and cherry orchards that make up this very interesting wine region. And, of course, it's a cooler climate wine region wedged between two warm climate wine regions. And from here... Thanks to uh, elevation, really, right? I mean, because we're kind of talking about fa different factors, but really it's is the elevation and some maritime influence, right? But more elevation in Adelaide Hills that would cause it to be able to produce co more cooler climate styles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a force of evolution. And, and, and I guess microclimate as well. You tend to find that cold air pockets and stores itself in these, I mean, at times quite vertiginous hillsides, these big... Mm -hmm. Um, angular slopes that fall into little gullies and valleys um, and all these pockets keep cool air in them quite well um, it's a it's a very beautiful part of Australia M lots of very tall old trees little rivers running through uh, koalas in the trees a lot of native wildlife here and these vineyards which predominantly have been planted through the 1970s to today 
uh, a sort of cornucopia of interesting producers have emerged both from the latter part of that um, planting and also more current day where, of course, the, I guess you say the, the uh, commune of natural winemakers have emerged from, particularly from the parish of Basket Range. Uh, but that's probably another story in some respects. In terms of general conversation about the Adelaide Hills, the, the wines are brighter and fresher and, and people's takes on Pinot Noir and Syrah, uh, some of the original plantings of Cabernet, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot, uh, and now increasingly the Italian orientated grape varieties, uh, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, uh, Nero da Avola, uh, creating these bright, crunchy, vivacious, uh, thirst quenching styles that are much more, I think, in line with the general conversation we're heading towards, which is that uh, these are the these are the neo wines of Australia. These are the wines that uh, reflect much more accurately how we live, eat, drink, and sleep in Australia. Uh, and it's interesting that it sort of has a no rules approach in some respects in, in in wine regions like the Adelaide Hills, where judicious blending of whatever grape varieties you enjoy can find groundswell in popularity in the more savvy wine bars and restaurants of Australia. So people blending, say, Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc would not be something that was unheard uh, to try and produce something that was a few grades up the pay scale from rosé to be drunk young, fresh and chilled during summer months or even very quickly after harvest. That's sort of the idea of many of these wines is uh, in relatively quick turnaround from harvest in January, February, March, and have wines out on the market in the dying days of autumn where it's still quite warm in places like Adelaide. Uh, and if not, then the ubiquitous conversation in Australia with some of these producers is spring release. So as soon as the uh, relatively short period of winter is over, uh, there's these delightful, dancing, pretty red wines that are ready to drink uh, as soon as people are willing to start drinking them outdoors again or drinking them with fresh seafood or whatever might be the pathway that people are taking in that new season. Now for a quick break. We're very excited to tell you about an all new podcast from our partner site, Thirsty Nest, the first wine and spirits registry for the modern couple. This podcast is called Can I Buy You a Drink? And on it, founder Jackie Strum will interview wine and wedding industry up-and-comers about their very own meet-cute stories and their path to finding the one. It's a dreamy break from all the scary headlines that will warm your cold, cold heart. So check out Can I Buy You a Drink from the Thirsty Nest team on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or any other platform that you prefer. And it's interesting, you've already touched upon this a lot, this sort of, it's hard to talk about something like light reds, you know, as, as broad as that is. It's hard to talk about that and then not also talk about, you know, the cultural side of it. They sort of run parallel. So, you know, even even in a place like Barassa, you still have producers who, you know, like Ragabellas, like Abel, for example, who are, you know, just also just choosing to make a lighter style because it's what they like to drink and it's what, you know, a lot of their customers like to drink. And then you have a region like the Great Southern in Western Australia. Australia, which, um, you know, has this maritime influence is very cool climate. But, you know, I would say things are shifting recently, but um, for a while was still making like pretty meaty, bigger style Shiraz. Um, certainly they were a more savory, you know, maybe more medium body style than, you know, Barossa was, but still a big style for the climate. So, you know, there is something to be said also just for the taste of the winemaker and for the culture of that particular place and the time, you know, the time and the place as well. So it's kind of, they run parallel with each other, I think. Yeah, hundred you, percent. You, you're very astute in that observation. And, and of course, that's your dedicated groundwork in Australia, which has been so um, welcomed um, as a great journalist and in some respects advocate, let's say, of, of looking to the diversity of Australian wine rather than um, pigeonholing for uh, certain styles. Um, I, I'm really grateful you brought up Great Southern. Great Southern is a wine region in Western Australia. And, of course, uh, Australia's naming of states is far less interesting than the United <laughs> States. We literally just give geographical landmarks. Um, I don't know. You've got Tumbarumba. Come on. That's that's a pretty awesome yeah. name. <laughs> we, we do, we're pretty easy when we call things South Australia and Western Australia because 
Western Australia, incredibly enough, is in the west part of Australia, uh, is the largest state. It basically takes up a third of Australia almost, um, taking out the entire west of the big island of Australia. And the wine regions of Western Australia basically span the southwest of Western Australia. Uh, and Great Western is about a four and a half hour drive south of Perth. Great, great Southern, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, great, great, Southern. great Western's yeah. another. <laughs> that's another another one. <laughs> Too many Western. Great Southern. Great Southern is in the southwest of Western Australia, about four and a half hour drive south of Perth. Perth being the major city, it's the capital city of Western Australia. Uh, Perth is often dis- is, Perth is often described as the world's most isolated capital city. So I would wager that Great Southern, which is basically four and a half hours drive on a straight road through almost desolate farmland and native Australian forest, probably is the world's most isolated wine region. Um, and it's also Australia's biggest in terms of land mass. That's right. what's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Gippsland there and Tasmania would be the three that form the largest wine regions in Australia, uh, by my judgment. But Great Southern, as you said, is you know sticks out into the the sort of Southern Ocean and takes on a lot of the maritime influence that whips its way up from Antarctica. Uh, the wine region itself is. Um, broad and diverse and it's it's again a very creative and very communal place it's a it's a wine region that seems to feel very comfortable doing its own thing not worrying about it slightly further north well by three hours neighbors of margaret river the very prestigious wine region that excels at uh cabernet blends and chardonnay um great southern has sort of formed its its identity around Shiraz, uh, to an extent Riesling as well. Uh, but um, in, in conversation about the wines and wine styles there, you're right. I mean, there, there sort of was a bit of a me too, me too feel to uh, the mid-90s and early noughties wines that were coming out of Great Southern where they were trying to amplify and turn up the volume on local red wines. And I think the Great Southern producers have become very comfortable over the last decade with producing medium weight, uh, even at times lightweight, fragrant, spicy, um, svelte red wine that doesn't indeed mimic the warm climate regions that are found uh, in South Australia, let's say, predominantly pumping out the bigger, fuller flavoured red wine styles that seem so synonymous with Australia. And it's a place where a lot of regional spice character can be found in the wines, which I would find very appealing. And almost a, a sort of DNA thread of um, minerally silty, you know, like the feel of, of sort of pumice stone. Um, totally, yeah. Tannin. There's a really distinct, yeah, completely. <laughs> I'm just not nodding vigorously in, in agreement with that. It's a, it's a, they're fun to taste blind because I think I, yeah, you're always like, oh, that's great Southern. It's so distinctive. It's that tannin structure and that spice. It's really distinctive to the region. And I agree. I think the wines are, the reds particularly have come a long way in what I've seen over the last decade or so. They've, they've yeah, they've really come into their own. And um, yeah, I think they're in a really good spot right now. So moving back, we've been jumping and that was my fault. I kind of brought us, tore us away from the east and brought us, or from the south, I should say, and brought us to the west. Going back uh, back over, if you kind of picture on a map, we've gone to the west, going back over to Victoria, just briefly, uh, just to talk about um, Mornington. We can touch on Mornington Peninsula because I think that's an important region we shouldn't uh, shouldn't forget about. Um, and in terms of being very, mar- the maritime influence that is overlooked a lot, I think, in Australian uh, Australian wine. And then um, heading to the, to of course, let, we have elevation, maritime, and latitude, of course, which are all three major factors in being able to create these cool climate wines. Then talking, finally, I'd love to just end on Tasmania and be able to spend a little bit of time talking about Tasmania. So um, could you could you just orientate people a little bit to, to Mornington Peninsula, Mike? Sure thing. So Mornington Peninsula is about a 45-minute drive east and south of Melbourne, which is the capital city of Victoria. And again, sort of sits in the middle of the south bit of Victoria, 
which is in the southeast of the great Australian continent. Uh, and Mornington Peninsula forms the eastern part of a large bay that has Melbourne at its centre. It's almost like a crescent shape. Uh, and on the eastern part of the crescent shape is Mornington Peninsula. And on the western part of the crescent shape, again, about 45 minutes drive away from Melbourne, this time heading west, is Geelong, another wine region. And Geelong and Mornington Peninsula are effectively, well, they're peninsulas that stick out into the ocean. If you imagine a crescent moon, um, a frowning smile, let's say, then the bottom bits of that frowning smile are the Mornings Peninsula on the east and the Geelong wine region on the west. Now, both these places are, for me, uh, fascinating because of they're so exposed to maritime influence. I mean, these are particularly Geelong with its hungry soils, almost sort of desert-like appearance and at times quite uh, insufferable wind. Uh, very interesting places to grow grapes. Mornington Peninsula has a little bit more protection, but does take on a lot of influence from the ocean. Uh, basically, vineyards sit on this very narrow peninsula and just get whipped over by uh, the wind, the, take on the first cold weather from the south, and growing seasons are very long and slow uh, and produce, by and large, wines that are uh, relatively delicate and fine. Uh, these are wine regions that have again championed in Syrah but to an extent have also looked at the fine wine paradigms possible from Pinot Noir uh, and they are both renowned for producing very high quality uh, at times very high priced uh, and at times sustained by very fancy cellar door experiences um, wines of great caliber and wines that have really captured the imagination of the fine wine market in Australia. And Mornington Peninsula I like a lot um, because it, it does do a diversity of style despite having a kind of overlay of similarity between a lot of the producers. You get quite rich fruit character but very fresh feeling fruit character in Mornington Peninsula. And, of course, great producers like Peringa Estate uh, have produced wines of, of almost um, power using Pinot Noir and Syrah. Uh, quite unsuspecting for a cool climate wine region, but still managed to retain this incredible acidity and freshness. Um, there's, of course, other producers in Mornings Peninsula like Main Ridge Estate, uh, a boutique operation that would again sit in the really high upper reaches of fine wine in Australia uh, and smaller scale production. Uh, and they almost have wines that are undrinkable in youth because of their tension, tannin structure and just general fruit personality. Um, they're so reluctant to come out of the glass and be friendly when they're first poured that good, long, hard decants are almost re you know, required activity around them, and if not, then long time in cellar. Um, that doesn't mean that, of course, everybody's producing wine in that way. Uh, younger generation outfits like Polpero, uh, a, a, a duo of fun-loving guys who are producing more vivacious, uh, fruity, lighter, fresher wine styles and experimenting a bit, sit alongside producers like Ocean 8 who have made their name, you know, reasonably well known in international markets for being champions of more into Peninsula but producing wines with a bit more vivacity and, and levity in their youth. Uh, yeah, we the, Ocean Eight is actually one of the few Mornington producers we have in the states. Sadly, not enough Mornington gets over here, and I think again, it's a product of sort of the the word about how good um, Pinot, particularly from Pinot Noir from Australia, can be, has just not gotten out. And of course, they have quite a bit of competition with domestic wines here uh, in that department. But um, we do get Ocean Eight, and I was just tasting them recently and was really impressed. We get Moraduk Estate, who I think are really solid and always produce. Yeah. Really both pretty, but really, really pretty powerful, powerfully structured wines, but always with a prettiness uh, about them. So we do get a few. Yarra Valley, we get a fair amount. They're pretty well represented, relatively well represented here. And um, Great Southern, we're getting more and more too. We have Franklin Estate, who are always yeah. excellent. Um, Forest Hill, who are, have, I think, been really killing it the last couple of years. They've I've been really impressed with with where they've gone to. I don't know if you've been able to taste them recently, but like they're yeah. Highberry Fields, like some of their, it's, it's just yeah, no looking, 
look, they're they're a perfect example, I think, of Shiraz that's in that sort of spicy, medium-bodied style. And I'm really thrilled. They've just come into the country recently. So I'm really thrilled that they're here. And I think we're finally going to get some La Violetta over here too, which is exciting. That, so That's one of the probably the most exciting. I just tasted through a, a large suite of his wines. Um, he would release 24 five or so wines a year I think yeah and yeah. they are just they're just like a you know a clown has vomited into a multicolored <laughs> mini minor car. like they're just fun and exciting and different and they're but good like always yeah, just totally. really solid I don't think I've ever yeah. had a like a bad wine from this is this no. is a guy called Andrew Holdley La Violetta he's just been a just well, I agree like just one of the most exciting but like just fun but but good, but good. a really talented oh, yeah. winemaker you know who's yeah. is really has kind of proven that you can be experimental and do funky stuff with but also make really clean delicious wines like yeah over very, and over again with consistency very, very much so very elegant very finely tuned red wines and he's quite clever with judicious blending of grape varieties that don't seem to be easy bedfellows but he finds a way and he is a bit of a master of blending white grape varieties with red grape varieties to sort of bring that out inherently um yeah I like the yeah. From that. yeah no I'm I'm really excited that he's finally I've been begging for him to be <laughs> begging him for orders and it wasn't that there was a lack of interest it was you know I'm sure many other factors but anyway I, I word on the street is he's finally going to be in the state so look out for La Violetta um and we need to start start bugging some of those Mornington producers to get over here and, and hopefully see a little bit more of them. So I'm just going to steer us because we're, we're, we're running out of time a little bit. Just steer us to Tasmania yeah. now because I, I really want to make sure we give it a little bit of time. It's a really important wine region. Again, it's one that we get woefully few wines over here. And partly that is because, I mean, similar similarly to Mornington, boutique region, you, a lot of small high-end producers. Um, so by the time the wines make the, their way over here, they're, they're usually not cheap, but I highly, highly recommend trying to seek seek out some Tasmanian wine. So tell us a bit about Tasmania, Mike. Well, Tasmania is an island that sits off Australia. If you hop in a plane from Sydney, it takes about an hour and a half to fly there. If you hop in a plane from Melbourne, it takes about an hour to fly there. Um, the island is a sort of almost equidistant east to west, north to south, almost. Uh, it's this very beautiful, uh, surprisingly dry climate down there uh, that's one of the largest native wilderness areas on earth that is untouched forest, is located in the southwest of Tasmania. This is basically a place where uh, people aren't allowed to go into. It's actually sort of off limits unless you are on a guided path to actually access this extraordinary unexplored wilderness area. Uh, but most of the winemaking takes place in the north along what's called the Tamar River um, or it takes place in the south in various wine regions that sit around the capital city of Hobart or there is a small but not insignificant wine area on the east coast of Tasmania and that's that's kind of it. It's north, east and south. If you drive from the south where Hobart City is located, which is a very beautiful, one of Australia's oldest cities, lots of big sandstone buildings, um, open parks, and of course, as with most Australian cities, a beautiful harbour. If you drive north from Hobart through the centre of Tasmania, um, it takes you about three hours to get up to the Tamar River and to start exploring the wine regions that sit within the banner of Tamar Valley wine growing area. Um, ta Tasmania the entire island is one wine region, which irks a lot of people because the north is so distinct from the south. I mean, three hours drive is effectively, you could get from Zurich to Piedmont in that time if you're in Europe. I mean, this is a gigantic area to span for a single wine region. And of course, uh, it's about an hour and a half either direction from the north or the south to the east coast where the wine region is. Um, planted on extraordinarily volcanic soils. Uh, it's actually where they make a lot of the gravel that produces the roads in Tasmania is digging up the old volcanic rock on the east coast of, of Tasmania. So you've got in the north, slightly 
it's, it's all and it's all very cool climate is also the message here. This is this is the very south of Australia. This is about as close as you can get to Antarctica without being in the very southern part of Chile or in the very southern part of New Zealand. So growing grapes in the south is very marginal. I mean, this is wine making on its edge. And a lot of the wines from the south, which are typically very small producers, uh, notwithstanding some of the stalwarts, particularly the biodynamic superstar of Stefano Lubiana, are down there in the south. Um, but the little producers like Sailor Seeks Horse, Chateau Wines, Stargazer, Meadowbank, uh, are all wine producers that perhaps are completely unfamiliar names to a larger audience, but are all becoming quite significant in these very edgy, lean, skeletal, but very incredibly complex wines produced predominantly from Pinot Noir that exist in the south of Tasmania. Um, and if you, if you sort of go north of Hobart City about 35 minutes, you end up in the Coal River Valley uh, and you begin to see producers uh, like uh, Domaine A, which is actually a Cabernet producer and produces very leafy, very light-bodied, but still quite intense Cabernet wines, uh, unusually, almost entirely dedicated to Cabernet in uh, an environment that's so very much so orientated towards Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, and, of course, uh, Toll Puddle, which is the Tasmanian project of Shore and Smith. Uh, and Toll Puddle has gained a lot of traction internationally for being, um, you know, an important new estate in Tasmania and globally a bit of a touchstone for fine Pinot and Chardonnay wines from Australia. But if you travel up to the north to the Tamar Valley, this is sort of the engine room of Tasmania in terms of particularly sparkling wine production. Uh, but in terms of the red wine styles from up there, slightly fuller bodied than you get down south and slightly less um, gravelly tannin than you'd find from, say, the East Coast. Um, the East Coast Pinots are almost distinct in that when I often taste them, I'm sometimes drawn straight to Mount Etna. I think about Norello Mascalese and I think about the tannin profile that you get from that extraordinary volcano and the northern slopes of Etna and the tannin profile on the East Coast of Tasmania can find a kindred spirit in some regards. Uh, but up north, there's a little bit more plushness. Uh, there's quite a few degrees more warmth per year in the northern part of Tasmania along the Tamar. Uh, but the wines, again, I mean, they, these, these are light, ethereal Pinot Noir. This is not full-throttle Pinot. This is not being able to plump up alcohols in Pinot Noir. And, and by and large, a, a, a great number of producers, uh, producers like Dalrymple, um, Jantz, Ninth Island, uh, Clover Hill, uh, dabble in Pinot Noir, and then also produce sparkling wines of extraordinarily high quality. I mean, Northern Tasmania for me, particularly, is where I would take the Champenois to say, "See, other people can do it just as good as you, if not better." With a better kind Andrew Peary's apogee, apogee, which we do have here, is taste that blind against any top champagne it's extraordinary yeah i mean house of arras the um yeah. extraordinary yeah. singularly focused sparkling wine project yeah um from ed carr is is a landmark thing oh, to sorry, yes, ed carr, yeah what's natalie what's natalie fryer's label she's got bell bonnet which is her oh, own bell independent. Bonnet, that's right. yeah so yeah, Tassie's, Tassie, Tasmania for me, if, if, if I'm asked, and this is sort of to, to, to draw us out to the conclusion of the conversation about cool climate Australia, irrespective of cool or warm climate or lighter, fresh styles from Australia, I'm very much interested in Tasmania. To me, this is one of the regions of Australia that needs a lot of conversation internationally because it's such an interesting, uh, beautiful place to visit. and produces an array of wine styles that are both compelling for quality but also for distinguishing themselves from what is perceived as the norm in Australia. I completely agree. Completely agree. I was just blown away by Tasmania. I just managed to get there for the first time recently. And thank you very much for your, you gave me some wonderful recommendations as well. And I was absolutely blown away by, by the island on so many, so many levels, but the wines were 
just outstanding. So I really hope that we can see more of them here. And I guess the more conversations like this we have, hopefully the more that we will see, but you can certainly get Toll Puddle here in Clover Hill, a little bit of Apogee, a little bit of Cellar Seek's Horse. Um, but I think the more people that know and, and, and drink Tasmanian wines, the more that we'll, we'll start to see them over here. Great. Yeah. I mean, please, please seek out these wines for, for, for the diversity and interest that they uh, posit in your glass. Yeah. And just a quick uh, mention in terms of some of the wines that we've talked about today, if you do want to see some of my reviews, some recent reviews, I have recently reviewed Whole Puddle, um, Forest Hills in the, our buying guide as well. Um, and let's see, Mac Forbes uh, I recently reviewed. So um, you can just get a little bit more info about those specific wines, how I, my thoughts about them uh, by going to the buying guide at Wine Enthusiast. So we're going to wrap this up, Mike. This was um, so, you make my job so easy because you are just a wealth of info and it's so appreciated. And I know uh, that that listeners will take away so much about, and hopefully if they take away nothing else, it's just how incredibly diverse Australian wine is. So really, really appreciate you taking the time to share all this knowledge with us. Uh, look, thank you for having me. It's such a treat to be able to speak with you and catch up and generally just in Australia, as we say, talk broadly about things. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wine Enthusiast podcast. There is definitely a wide world of lighter bodied Aussie Reds worth checking out. And we certainly covered a lot of them today, including recently reviewed selections from Yarra Valley, Tasmania, Great Southern, Mornington Peninsula, and more. Be sure to visit winemag.com slash podcast for ratings and reviews from these regions, including specific producers highlighted in this show, as well as additional links to learn more about these wines and where to find them. Subscribe to the Wine Enthusiast podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you liked today's episode, we'd love to read your review and hear what you think. And hey, why not tell your wine-loving friends to check us out too? You can always drop us a line at podcast at winemag.com. For more wine reviews, recipes, guides, deep dives, and stories, visit Wine Enthusiast online at winemag.com and connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Wine Enthusiast. The Wine Enthusiast podcast is produced by Lauren Buzio and Jenny Groza. Until next episode, cheers. Cheers.